All right, everybody, welcome to the Daily Space Weather. And we're doing it live once again on Twitch uh, for very interesting reasons. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Wait till you see this. We just had an M class solar flare. So uh, if you think that's kind of odd, so do we. And I'm your host, Smash a Mash, aka Dan. And there's the solar flare we're talking about an M class X ray flare just occurred while I was doing show prep for you here, folks. And that is not one that you see every day. That's, uh, that seems to be the standard issue divine providence that we see on our channel all the time as things happen unexpectedly. Do we plan that out and do it on purpose? Survey said. Allow me to rephrase. Again, we are streaming this live. We do things like that on purpose on the channel. Survey said. This thing never allows me to be right. So we've got solar flares on the opposite side of the sun here. I mean, uh, coronal mass ejections on the opposite side of the sun here. And don't get the two confused, folks. One is protons and one is photons. So there we see that one. That's headed out away from the Earth. And yesterday we showed you one headed toward the Earth. And uh, I haven't even gotten to load all of my tabs. So you, you may have to bear with me a minute as I generate certain things here. I apologize for any delay. Again, we are doing it live. So let's take a look at uh, the most recent 94 Angstrom's 48 hour video. As that's a significant solar flare. And uh, I have a feeling it came out of this active region up in the north. This region right here. And allow me to get off of the screen. Shh. Check it out. 99% sure that that flare came from that area as it looks quite active. And it would only be in the last tiny portion of this, of this movie. And let's move on and look at some more stuff here. Again, thanks for tuning into the stream, folks. We are live on Twitch right now. And I wasn't, I was going to actually take a little longer to go up, but uh, I put the video up immediately because I saw that M-Class flare. So let's take a look at what's going on here on Helio Viewer. Turn the magnetic field back on. And there you can see brightest spot is certainly up there in the northeast. And sadly, we don't have access to the GOES X-ray imager right now, so I have a feeling that's where that flare came from. So it could be already a sunspot up there. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, as it's already produced a flare of that magnitude. Anyway, there are the fields. We don't see any umbrae yet when I did show prep. And there's 304 angstroms. We did make one custom Helio Viewer movie that should capture the flare, I believe. And that was just luck. I didn't even see that until after I queued that up. So, uh, let that play for a minute for your solar viewing pleasure as I gate back in to the prime material plane of existence. Okay, portal, you can close now. All right, that's better. Man, oh man, they don't make portals like they used to. All right, and again, please leave us a comment if you are viewing live. Let's take a look at the scenario here in, uh, how about 131 angstroms as well? There's a 48 hour SDO movie in that wavelength. So that's, that's uh, the largest solar flare that we've seen in years, folks. Um, and this is just one of the many reasons why sunspot number is not the only feature when it comes to mapping solar activity. Next, we'll look at the KP index. There's yesterday. 
And we're down to zero today, folks. And the 10.7 centimeter radio flux is, I, I think it's still at 68. Let me just check on spaceweather.com here. Looks like it's still at 68 solar flux units. So there you go, spaceweather.com covering the same thing. 68 is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. And uh, time to talk cosmology for a quick moment. It's the a cosmology segment. So yeah, um, first of all, shout out to Robert Burke for making this video about Wisconsin's electronic extraction event. All right. Now this lake, Devil's Lake, is a naturally formed lake, which could not have been produced by drainage because it's much higher than all the drainage basins around it. Here's a clip. Bottom rests around 600 feet above sea level, or 200 feet below the surrounding Mississippian Basin. So there are all kinds of uh, interesting ge geologic features that are attributed to erosion that could not have possibly been caused by erosion. Which means and, uh, that it does not drain. I consider all of this stuff to be cosmology subjects considering how these things must form. Now, the seasons are part of cosmology, depending on the way you look at things. And we'll be doing a live stream similar to this one, the same. It'll be the same as this one, only different. So it won't be the daily space weather at all. We're going to talk about all kinds of things. It'll be like a variety show. And we may even feature phone calls from viewers into one of our VOIP phones. So. Join us for the Solstice Stream 2020 at the moment of the Solstice. Where will you be at 5.43 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on June 20th? Come to our Solstice Stream. And yes, we spelled Solstice wrong on purpose, so it's easier to find on places like YouTube. Let's talk more cosmology. The sun's sunspot cycle appears to be governed by its solar polar fields. On solon.info, the solar polar field strength graph has just been updated as this is uh, requires a lot of magnetometer data to make these graphs and so there you can see where it was on March 31st I believe is their last data point it goes into April too I think I forget what I think it says what data was updated anyway you can see that we are, this is the, the black line here is the net fields, and uh, the north solar polar field did level out there, and so did the south one. So those are interesting. That's something to keep an eye on, and we're not going to get super in, in depth into that. I did want to talk briefly about the butterfly diagram. I believe it was Hale that discovered this. Um, that sunspots at the beginning of solar cycles start up here at high latitudes and you don't get many at low latitudes and at the end of a solar cycle you get only sunspots at low latitudes and none at high latitudes. This and the polarity are the two ways that we figure out which cycle a sunspot belongs to. If you want to read up on that, some good information there on solarsystemcentral.com slash sunspot cycles page. If you just type in, I think I typed in butterfly sunspot diagram, and it was the first link at aduckduckgo.com. So it's got an image of a uh, sunspot. I don't know which sunspot that is. Who the heck knows? And you can see uh, solar activity has been weakening since around 1958 when it went a little bit crazy and cycle solar cycle 24 uh, may be the weakest probably the weakest cycle during your lifetime uh, unless you're exceedingly old and let's look at some transients so here are the x-ray transient bursts from Sagittarius A star. Now we get all kinds of different photonic wavelengths out of Sagittarius A star. And this is soft x-rays. 
Anyway, those are the emissions from Sagittarius A star. If you want to look this stuff up yourself, it is constantly being archived at the Neil Gorel's Swift Burst Alert Telescope, the Neil Gorel Swift Observatory. So if you want to look up an object there, for instance, the crab pulsar, type in Control F, type in crab, it'll give you nine responses. And the fourth response is entry 180, the crab pulsar. And it's actually been very weak in the past few days. You see it's been barely producing any x-rays. And uh, the crab pulsar is a very interesting pulsar in that it's so consistent, as you can see on the historic graph over here, it's so consistent that it's actually used to calibrate things like x-ray telescopes. So anyway, there's the crab pulsar. Let's look up one more object as I'm interested to see what Cygnus X3 is doing, otherwise known as Deneb, visible in the northern hemisphere right now. Part of the Summer Triangle, along with Altair and Deneb, C Cygnus X3, the tail of the swan, the star at which Gobekli Tepe appears to be oriented, as well as various other ancient megalithic structures. And it looks like it's actually ramped down here in the past week, having just come out of its quiescent state. You can see on the historic graph here, whoops, you can see on the historic graph here, it was just in a quiescent state, and now it's back into a more normal state around 0 0.03 so could be ready to flare back up again and of course we don't know the overall cyclicity of any of these objects so again if you want to follow that stuff Neil Gorel Swift Bat Observatory and not every object out there will be on this um, but for instance if you wanted to look up oh I don't know uh, I think I hit the wrong button folks hope I didn't screw anything up all right, we're good. As long as I didn't hit the wrong button, Control F is the correct button to find things. And how about 3C405? The massive radio galaxy known as Cygnus A, which will be on a t-shirt that we'll be putting out soon. Our first merch is going to feature this galaxy, actually. And this is the second strongest radio source in the sky. As far as X-ray sources, it's not really that strong. And we are viewing this galaxy from, you could say, parallel to its galactic disk, or perpendicular to its jets, would be an appropriate way to say the orientation between us and Cygnus A. Radio Galaxy 3C405, a catchy name. Moving away from cosmology, I guess locations of things like planets in, in the solar system would be cosmology, right? There's where things will be in a week. And it looks like we'll have a full moon and an oppositional Venus at the same time. How you like them apples, folks? Should make for some fireworks around sunset and sunrise. Sunset and or sunrise, depending on where you're located. And here's where stuff is above my head right now. I like to use in-the-sky.org. And for some reason, I can't animate anymore. I don't know if it's a browser plugin problem or what the deal is there, but... There's where stuff is now. I don't need to animate it anyway. I just hit refresh. And if you're up before dawn, you should be able to see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars up there on the ecliptic. And there's that M-class flare we were talking about. Check it out. The largest flare we've had in years. I don't remember when the last M-class flare was, and I'm not going to look it up on any sort of historic data. But how you like them apples. And shout out to Lance Armstrong. I won't say how you like them effing apples, as Lance did after winning a large mountain stage. If you want to send Lance gifts, send him a basket of apples. He'll get it, and you, you'll get it too. So we saw a bunch of B flares, and then pow, an M flare, as I did show prep. Now the sun's not out here, so I didn't get really x-rayed at all, did I? There's the ghost proton flux. Although, at noontime... Well, not really very much flaring happening. I didn't get x-rayed particularly at all. And there's the ghost proton flux. By the way, it's at noontime universal. It would be... Uh, I'm sorry. At, at 5 p.m. universal, it would be noontime here. We're Greenwich Mean Time, uh, Greenwich mean time minus 5. If you're, if you're wondering because you're viewing from a different location. Please leave a comment if you're 
viewing from a different universe, galaxy, solar system, plane of existence, or timeline. <coughs> All right, there's a ghost proton flux. Nothing to comment on there. Next, we'll look at the real-time solar wind, I think. And we see some shifts in the phi angle recently, as well as the BTBZ. Nothing to write home about particularly there. Some coronal hole, uh, coronal hole magnetic connections appear to be going on around there, around uh, 3.39 this morning, UT. That's universal time. And solar wind density, around 5 protons per cubic centimeter, about the same as yesterday at this time. And a very low solar wind speed, about as low as you'll ever see it, hopefully, at 278 kilometers per second. By the way, check out smashomash.com slash forum if you haven't been there yet. We've got a whole cosmology forum. And we may have to update the most, and certainly the fast radio bursts, as there's been a really strong one detected by some Canadians. So using the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, otherwise known as CHIME, a radio telescope, they've detected an ultra-bright millisecond duration radio burst from SGR 1935 plus 2154. If you want to read the article, it is on the phys.org section. And in fact, I'll just let it scroll. And then you can just read it on, on this video without even having to go anywhere. Again, it's located at phys.org. And I did not do the video in pink underwear and no pants for any reason other than to show off to phys.org. Just kidding, folks. I did the video wearing pink underwear and no pants because it's pretty hot in the smash bunker right now. As we haven't turned on the air conditioning yet, so now we're looking at the geospace magnetosphere movies to see very diffuse spread out Van Allen belts, very large diffuse plasma spheres, a very odd environment indeed, likely caused by the incredibly low relativistic electron flux. We'll show you that in a moment. First, we'll look at the uh, ground magnetic perturbations, of which we don't expect to see very many during this polar excursion. While we've got a North Pole up here over northern Canada, we've got a North Pole over Siberia, we've got a net pole here over east of Greenland, and the South Pole over here in the Indian Ocean somewhere. Yes, that's right, folks. It's a massive geomagnetic polar excursion. Anyway, there's the ground magnetic perturbations. The GOES magnetometers are showing us some smoother magnetism here, and that is measured in nanotesla. So looking a little smoother there in terms of solar magnetism, as measured by the GOES-16 at least. And if you're wondering what these mean, these are noon and midnight time for the local satellite. So. It's helpful to know when the satellite is facing the sun and when the satellite is adjacent with Lagrange point two, as opposed to Lagrange point one. Now we're looking at the Gong 2 data, the ecliptic plane top view, ecliptic plane field plot. So you can see the Earth is solidly in the South Pole oriented portion of the current sheet here shown in red, and the North Pole current sheet has come back. So. That active region north of the equator there, the one that emitted that X-ray flare, um, not likely to cause the North Pole field to come through. We won't get into it. Here's the line of sight field plot. There's the B field shown in blue. And don't be surprised to see this get a little bit pulled down by that sunspot. Well, it's likely a sunspot to have produced an M-class flare. And enough said about that. And there's a relativistic electron flux, which you can see has sunk into an incredibly low pattern here. It's not as low as it's ever gotten or anything like that, but it's been consistently low since, I mean, since around early April, it uh, has just been consistently low. There's the GOES electron flux, the three day and you can see the uh, greater than and equal to 2 mega electron volt uh, electron flux is also quite low. We haven't seen a warning level for weeks. And here
here's the total electron content going all the way from the thermosphere to the ionosphere. And you can see very low levels of electron flux in that entire column. Expect your GPSs to be working well. And here's one of those layers, the ionosphere. That's six hours of data updated 15 minutes per second. This one's provided by Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology. And let me just check the chat. Anybody leaving a chat? Nope. I guess it's time for me to come back. Anyway, there's six hours of data. Nothing to write home about there. Things looking pretty normal in the ionosphere. Let's bring up the latest image, which is from 745. And that's in universal time. Scrolling up the earthquake list, we don't see anything over a six magnitude over the past 24 hours. There's a 5.0 very far south in the uh, South Atlantic. 5.8 at Tonga the largest quake they've had there for quite a while, and uh, that one occurring near the surface over the top of the deep earthquake capital of the world, the area north-northeast of New Zealand. And just scrolling up the list, small deep quake in uh, the Caribbean at Dominica, an island most people don't understand at all, Small deep quake in Alaska. A 4.5 magnitude deep quake at Japan. It's at 108 kilometers. And that's depth, by the way. Another small deep quake at Alaska. And a 4.9 in between Kamchatka and Russia. I mean, Kamchatka and Japan. It's a 4.9 at 165 kilometers depth. Followed in less than an hour by a 4.2 in southern Mexico. It's at 149 kilometers deep. And there's a deep quake at Tonga. It's at 585 kilometers depth and a 5.1 magnitude. Next volcanoes. Let's see what's going on regarding hot molten magma. Kluchaskoy exploding. producing a volcanic ash plume to a flight level of 23,000 feet above sea level, folks. Son of a beehive. That must be some molten magma. Hot molten magma. Mount also producing a 6,000-foot ash plume. Semeru exploding. 14,000-foot ash plume there. Dakono exploding. Flight level 7,000 there. What is going on? Increased gas flux at White Island Volcano, the one north of New Zealand that killed some people because of tour guides that didn't listen to volcano warnings or perhaps didn't know about volcano warnings. And thanks for commenting, Panny9. So more activity kicking off at White, White Island, the island north of New Zealand. Uh, I believe the only volcanic, the only known volcanic deaths and I think that was in 2019. It might have been earlier this year, I can't remember. I think it was 2019. Popocatapetl dispersed the ash. Revenador exploded. Explosive activity continues. 16,000 foot ash plume there. Flight level 24,000 as Sabad Kaya explodes as well. Please don't pull vault the caldera. If you enjoy the content, please press like and subscribe on YouTube. Share with your friends, share with your foes. Our videos are friendly for all advertisers. And every time one gets demonetized, it gets remonetized. So thanks to the folks over at YouTube who manually review the content and have no interest in the subject matter for citing the, for recognizing the fact that it's perfectly legit for advertisers. Now, if, if you follow us on Facebook, you may already know about Entropy Busters. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Entropy Busters. And we're going to be putting more content in there soon because there's been a lot of entropy going on, if you know what I mean. And allow me to take this thing and shove it, if you know what I mean. Now we've got a 31-page section on 
coronavirus on smashandmash.com slash forum. If you want to read all about that, it creates a timeline going all the way back to January 23rd, updated nearly every day. As it outlines a new roadmap for effective treatment, we picked up a SciTech Daily article and a SciTech Daily Shard article. Have you been reading Shard articles? Have you survived a global pandemic? Well, I suspect you probably have, unless you're viewing this content from the other side. Your ancestors survived a global pandemic. Well, some of them probably did. You know how I know? Because you're not dead. Your ancient ancestors survived things much more horrifying than a global pandemic. A pandemic of propaganda. By the way, do you follow us on Instagram? I don't know if you're aware. If you can do wheelies, um, you can do wheelies. But if you can't do wheelies, you must stay at home. No reference as to where those wheelies need to be done. And shout out to a Begamon Racing. Drop me a line. We also created a page on Entropy Busters. And just to give you some idea of the symbolism, as symbolism is kind of important. I don't know if you're aware. Let me blow that up. There you go. This Entropy Buster symbol is made from the galactic core of Andromeda, otherwise known as M31. The center features ultra-massive blue stars orbiting a massive radio source at shocking speeds on the order of hundreds of kilometers per second velocities. The outer ring, seen out here, the red and orange stars and yellow stars, features a wide array of cooler, less frantic stars likely gravitationally flung into the, parabol the parabolic arch-like oval star system. It's almost like a solar system where stars are the planets at the core. The inner system would feature, indeed, tidal, magnetic, particle stream, and heat on shocking scales. And that's why we made it this way. We made it look like entropy is being sucked into the black hole, and busters are doing just fine. Bright and golden. Searching out the truth. Now, speaking of the truth, everybody should keep a dream log. And dream logs are widely understood to have physical, psychological, spiritual, even social and emotional benefits. Don't ignore your dreams as you're writing them. Your brain is writing the dreams, okay? Your dreams are not controlled by somebody else. They're controlled by you. And if you've ever had a lucid dream, you would certainly believe me. But in any case, they're telling you things, most likely, about your reality. And not everybody should make their dream log, log public, and not every Alanis Morissette journal entry should be a song, but I'm more than happy to share some of mine publicly. So feel free, feel free to share yours, comment freely, and say whatever you want. We will not censor you like hashtag Big Tech. Have you noticed some problems with Big Tech that I've been citing for, oh, what, the last five years? I guess maybe folks will start to listen, who knows. Anyway. Here's the first entry. I'd like to share it with our space weather, our daily space weather video viewers. Back in 2002 or 2003 during summer, uh, I think when Tyler Hamilton was on T CSC to Scali, one of the worst doping teams ever, they doped so badly and so outrageously and so dangerously that practically the entire management and half the riders were banned for life from the sport, if I remember correctly. The recent biopics of Lance Armstrong reminded me of this hilarious dream. We've We've entitled it Test Testers. Lance, Tyler, and Dan get beeped up. So we're having a summer picnic house party, as was typically the case around those years, and attending the party is who else but two guys I've never met or talked to in my life, Lance Armstrong and Tyler Hamilton. So everybody's mingling with drinks in their hands. The music is blasting. It's nighttime, a normal summer picnic night. Then Lance and Tyler pull me aside, and they say below music levels, hey, you want to get beeped up with us? Not knowing what to expect, I'm like, okay, what will we do? They escort me out back in the shadows behind an alcove where the back porch light casts a shadow, and I'm like, okay, now what? Not knowing what to expect, but basically expecting one of them to light a joint or something normal, hand me mushrooms, I don't know. Here's what happens. One of these rubes, and I don't know which one, I think it was Lance, but I'm not entirely sure, let me backtrack. My dream was not depicting them as rubes, nor as meatheads, but as nerds. Because wait for it, wait for it, one of them reaches into a pocket, and we are wearing casual clothes, not cycling kits, by the way, and produces a tiny jar, a jar about this big, the kind of jar that testers model paints come in. You know the ones, right? They're like two ounces of paint for painting models. 
So I'm like, oh boy, here we go with the medicine droppers and the corticosteroids. But I don't say anything, and one of them produces a cotton swab, otherwise known by holders of Johnson & Johnson stock as a Q-tip. And he takes the lid off the tiny jar, and he dips the swab into the contents. Turns out it was tester's model paint, silver model paint, and we all sniffed this highly ineffective amount of paint solvents from the swab. We pass it around like a joint, and we, here you go, man. And that was me getting beeped up with Lance and Tyler in my dream, and uh, for real, that, that really didn't happen, but the dream really happened, and I don't know what the hell is wrong with my brain, folks, but that's just, the, that's what happened, so anyway. Here's the uh, weather.gov map, and we still got some flooding expected due to snow melt in the northern Rockies, as well as flood warnings here in northern misery. Let's talk about Charticles. <laughs> now, if you've ever looked at our playlists on YouTube, uh, you see we only have two terms defined in the terms defined playlist. One of them is a Charticle, and one of the purveyors of nonsense about atmospheric physics is phys.org's Earth section. So, gotta call them out specifically as they print so many shorticles on phys.org that it's just, it has to be cited that the, the articles, some of them are so bad, like the one I'm going to show you, that it's just ridiculous. If you're wondering what the word shorticle means, it is a portmanteau. Port, it's a portmanteau of two words, shart and article, because it's like an article that somebody sharted out they thought that they were just going to pass gas, but they sharted instead. They took a dump. And let me tell you, there's a lot of journalists, news agencies, scientists who are not scientists at all, getting paid six figures to write articles like this one. Volcanic eruptions reduce global rainfall. So this is, this is one of these things where somebody takes one variable and they don't understand any of the other variables and they change it in a computer model. It produces ridiculous, ridiculous and silly results, causing people to believe things like climate change is caused by carbon dioxide. Yes, I was taught that the, the carbon dioxide was the climate control knob. That was what everybody used to say back in the late 1980s. Now, I started studying climate change in 1987 to 1988 during the first earth science class that I ever had. Now, that class was taught by a guy who was probably a complete COVID-idiot nowadays. We won't mention his name because uh, he's a cretin. A cretin. Yes, cretin. I, pre I prefer the British pronunciation instead of cretin, all right? For you Americans, he's a cretin. For you non-Americans, he's a cretin. Anyway, he did have some good comments like, all right, folks, get your schist together. Get your schist together, folks. Get it? You know, it's a geology joke. Hilarious. That guy is soft as talc. Yeah, I know geology jokes. I, I know, it's crazy, right? Anyway, if you want to read this article, you may lose an IQ point because you may assume that it doesn't have a bunch of complete nonsense in it, but this... This has so much misinformation and disinformation and incorrect information that I don't even know where to start. So I'm not going to start. I'm just going to say, if you want to see lots of articles like this, head to phys.org's Earth section, and practically every article will slip something in about global warming and how it's caused by carbon dioxide. And I am sick of hearing about carbon dioxide. Stop trying to scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's the most important trace gas in the world. It's at the bottom of every relevant food chain. And it has nothing to do with the Earth's temperature, except a warmer planet produces more carbon dioxide due to a thing we call cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, folks. Learn what it is before you think all plants just seamlessly scrub carbon dioxide out of the air and don't use oxygen to perform cellular respiration and exhale carbon dioxide. All right, anyway. Here's another article, and if this one doesn't make you want to, you know, disembowel yourself, I don't know what will. From SciTech Daily. So we printed an article and a article from SciTech Daily onto the Daily Space. <laughs> Wearing face masks at home 
79% effective at curbing COVID-19 transmission to family members before symptoms emerge. So this is a prime example of how you can take any piece of cherry picked data and, and say some kind of an alarmist headline or write a terrible, ridiculous article for people that don't understand the first thing about the science. Oh, let me read that headline for you again. Now don't stab yourself, folks, don't stab yourself. Don't come up with a permanent solution to a temporary problem. If you stab yourself, you have to go to the hospital and you'll probably be in an emergency room full of COVID idiots. Wearing face masks at home, 79% effective at curbing COVID-19 transmission to family members before symptoms emerge. In other words, what it's not saying is you should wear face masks at home. You should just read the article if you're freaking out about it. It's a complete shed article. <laughs> well, it's, it's a complete shed line. It's a shed line and it should probably be retired to a shed where it collects dust and is never read. But if you want to read it, it's at SciTechDaily.com. And it still is my favorite science publication. They print plenty of articles about carbon dioxide and how it has anything to do with the Earth's climate. Anyway, there is some good news that some people are starting to understand that solar activity and ocean temperatures are actually what drive the Earth's climate. And when we say climate, we mean the long-term temperature trends. Let's advance the pressure maps here on windy.com's GFS forecast and allow things to progress to tomorrow around noon, where it's classified where I'll be. There's where things will be at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And some fairly anomalous looking systems there south of Alaska in the North Pacific. Next, looking at nullschool.net. Windy.com has a great mobile app too, by the way. And looking at windy.com, not, not windy.com, looking at nullschool.net. There we go. Now I know what I'm talking about. To show you extreme meridional jet stream flow in both hemispheres, check it out in the south. Yowzers. That is making for some cold temperatures in South America. And by the way, northern hemisphere folks, get ready to hear all about COVID all summer long because it's winter. It's moving into winter. You know, our solstice stream will celebrate the southern hemisphere's winter solstice. The time when all of this stuff gets worse as people stay indoors more and, of course, are in closer proximity and associated with less sunlight and heat, all things that have a tendency to destroy viral proteins. Anyway, there's a jet stream to the eastern world. Here are the water vapor maps for Europe and Africa. water vapor maps for the Far East and Oceania. How about a lightning map? Where's the lightning striking? We saw a bunch of lightning strike in southern Texas. Laredo, there's thunder rolling in, but you're out of the crosshairs. If you're, if you're viewing live in Laredo, get out and look to the east. You should have a lovely light show. Here is the uh, US Doppler radar map courtesy Weather Underground, the website named after terrorists from the 60s. We've got some severe thunderstorms in Pennsylvania for once. And let's look at that region in the south of Texas, as we've got some clouds moving the wrong direction here once again. Check it out. Okay, so we've got two air masses here. You can see there's, there's a, probably a pressure inversion happening there. You can see this water vapor looks like it's at a different altitude than some of the other water vapor. And we use a short wave satellite. The short wave radiation, NASA goes interactive weather satellite to see clouds at nighttime when it's too dark to see them with the visible. So here we are on the water vapor map now. Check it out. We've got these large areas of heavy moisture in the atmosphere moving almost completely the wrong direction. I mean, they're moving south. They're moving south, southwest. <laughs> and 
and uh, that's gonna that's gonna make for some issues in in, uh, in eastern Mexico. Let's look at that area close up, which should make it real obvious that we've got two different air masses creating that massive pressure gradient there, and you can see right here that's an upper level low moving over surface level dry air. Anyway, let's move on to thank our patrons for being the primary source of revenue for the channel. Please share on your social media. Uh, share with your friends, share with your foes, share with your science nerds, and share with your science noobs. We're also on Subscribestar and on PayPal. Thanks everybody who donates. Thanks to the Smash team for leaving comments, etc. Look for the merch coming out soon. Right now I'm wearing an effing shirt. I don't know if you can see that or not. It's my effing shirt. I've been designing clothing for decades, folks. So look for more to come. Don't forget to set the date for the Solstice stream, as we'll be streaming at the exact moment of the Solstice. How did you like them apples? Getting the uh, getting the M-Class solar flare, the largest flare in a couple of years, practically live. Was it luck, or was it Memorex? Or was it Divine Providence? There's the intensity gram to show you no sunspots. There's the colorized magnetogram. Let's see if we can see anything up here. And nothing to be seen yet. But some activity, and it's pretty welcome. Let's take a look at how about the nice 335 angstroms, one of my favorites. It's a 48 hour view. Any other comments? Penny nine? I don't see any. It's time to vanish. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, stare at the sun. Attempt to understand the physics. Don't drink, and if you do, don't drive. And since it'll never be now again, may that solar wind be at your back and that covidiacy absent from wherever you are.